All right. Greetings, everyone. I'm Mistress Christiana from McGrain. I am from the Kingdom of Meridies. Um, and uh, today has been quite the adventure to get here. We've had a very large storm blow through here on the East Coast. And my power went out this morning and has not come back on. The uh, power company says that it won't be on until tomorrow. So I have had to quickly pack up everything from my classes, my dog, myself, come down to friend's house, set back up. I got here 30 minutes ago. We have thrown together a, a classroom for myself and I'm here. <laughs> so I'm very glad to be back teaching again at the West Coast Culinary Symposium. I had the great opportunity to fly out and be there in person a few years ago. It was great. I enjoyed meeting everybody and taking all the great classes. I'm really sorry I missed stuff today, but I didn't have any power, so I couldn't really spend battery power to listen to classes. But luckily, things get recorded, and I'll be able to check them out later, like this one is. So uh, thank you for joining me, and I'm glad you came to kind of an un, a mysterious title like Medieval Flavors. And the topic of this class is a little not vague, but I like to think of it as more of a macro view of the flavor profile of the area and time period that we're studying. And it's such a vast area and time period. We're going to make some generalizations. We'll try and cut, touch on a few um, outside of European in resources and uh, encourage you to think about these things when you're doing research, research into specific topic that you want to put together that are going to be uh, influences that will have changed things specific to the area that you want to uh, uh, piece together or talk about the spicing, the way things would be spiced, things like that. So in order to understand the flavors of medieval foods, you have to understand more than what can be found on a recipe if you're lucky enough to have a recipe from the time period you're studying. We're going to take a look at the overall flavor profiles that were common in various regions and time periods. We'll discuss locally grown aromatics, common preparation techniques, and influences that would affect the menu such as seasons and harvest, the church calendar, and the humoral theory. And we'll discuss the availability of spices to various people during the Middle Ages. So uh, before we get into that part of my presentation, I want to talk a little bit about my documents. I have put in the chat a link to my Google Classroom, which is where all of the documents that I'm going to be referring to today are found. If you're unfamiliar with Google Classroom, it's a simple matter to get in. You have to be signed on to a Google account. Once you're there, you've got an icon picture in the upper right hand corner and there's a little box of nine dots. I've heard it called the waffle iron or other things. Um, if you click on hamburger that, menu, excuse me, hamburger menu, the hamburger menu. I've not heard that one before, but OK. If you click on that, you'll see all of your Google apps like Drive and Contacts and things like that. And Classroom is one of those. You may scroll down to see that it's in part of the suite that's been included. And if not, then it's a simple matter of downloading a free Google app of Classroom. So once you're there, I can give you a separate class code. This code should take you directly into the classroom. Once you're there, you have access to this Google Classroom. I generally never take down classes that I put up, so you should be able to get in and have access to anything that you see. If you I want, don't see it there. Okay. Let me What don't you see? Um anything re relating to your class. I have other classes there but not yours. When you click on Okay, let me give you the class code. I used the link that was in the chat. That usually just takes you right in, but if it didn't, that's okay. I will go ahead and copy the class code. Thank you. And give you that. I'm going to share from there in just a minute. So if you don't want to do this right now, you don't have to. Um, okay, if you typed in the same thing as the one I clicked on before, <laughs> it didn't work. That, did not work the way I wanted it to. All right, hold on. Let me do it this way. Also, it's nice to see you after all those years on the SCA Cooks email list. I know. All right, here we go. Let me try that. Okay, there's the Google Class code. Since you're already in Google Classroom, maybe it just took you, I don't know, maybe it took you directly to the dashboard. Mm -hmm. 
you should have the option of joining a class and then putting in that class code and it should take you to it. Do we All have right. to go to the classroom now? In you order do not. I'm about to share my screen and I will show you everything that you need to know that's in there and then you can go delete later. Okay. All right, so once you get into the class, it's going to look like this. Um, if you're on a phone, these tabs are on the bottom, but here we have on the top. Um, you're going to immediately go to the stream page. What you want to do is go to the classwork page, and that will take you to all of the documents there. Um, I'm going to go through this PowerPoint so you have access to go back and look at that and look at the illustrations. Um, Oh, that's my narration. That's the PowerPoint. Um, this is a list of spice blends in the Middle Ages. Um, and then these are spice blends from SCA Merchants. We're going to talk a little bit about those and some period spice blend recipes. So you have access to all of these documents. That's the one. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go through this, and um, if you would uh, mute yourselves, and I will take questions. If you have questions, if you can put them in the chat. My moderator, uh, Arwen, if you could keep an eye on the chat and let me know if we've got questions that come up. I will stop and ask for questions at points, so um, we'll see if people have questions uh, in between then, and then we'll just play it by ear from there. All right, so here we go. Let me see how this works. Can I do it this way? Nope. I just have to scroll down. Okay. So the church calendar dictated what the faithful could and could not eat according to the time of year, its current state of grace and the observances of local saints and feast days and fast days. This would determine whether you were eating any meat if you were in the socioeconomic class that would normally have had meat dairy, eggs, butter, and other indulgences. Regular fast days throughout the year ensured plenty of fish days among the flesh days. We have, uh, this is the peasant wedding by Bruegel the Elder, and this is clearly a feast day. It's a wedding feast. Um, and so we're actually going to talk about this painting again when we talk about porridge in my next class. Um, but what they're passing around to everybody, it's a very grain heavy uh, feast and you can see the grain that's hanging on the, the wall. So they're serving around bowls of porridge. They've got bread on the table and pictures of what's probably ale. So they've got all the grain products coming out in this feast, probably in the autumn. So what was in the agricultural year definitely affected what was going to be eaten in that day. Some other things that affected the flavors of the foods that you would prepare um, were the foods themselves. Hybridization was in their early days. Plants might have less sweetness, more rough textures, smaller fruits and root crops, and maybe larger stems. This uh, illustration is a lady who's harvesting beet greens. They weren't harvesting the, the roots at this time. Um, uh, they had not been developed the way we've developed them to be big and sweet and, um, and edible as a root crop. Um, I personally like beet greens much better than beet roots anyway. But um, the, the, when you see spinach in a recipe, it's probably, or it's not spinach, uh, Eat, it's probably the greens that they're talking about um, because the foods will have changed a little bit. Apples have changed quite a bit in the 500 years since the, our time period has passed. Um, so different textures, different produce, different, the, the way the produce looked would have been a little different. First nip would probably have been a little more fibrous, tail stems a little thicker, more seeds and less flesh in a melon, things like that. The humoral theory was the prevailing medical theory of the time among the swells. I think if you were in the peasant class, you might have heard of some of the humors and know that that food is poisonous and you shouldn't eat it or you should boil that one. But certainly you didn't have a doctor saying, well, this is how you should treat every meal. 
we don't have those kind of people today unless you're, you're you're very wealthy and you can pay a personal trainer right so how closely did you follow the humoral theory i think had a lot to do with your socioeconomic status food pre preservation had a lot to do with your flavors too you had a lot of um, smoking salting drying and pickling and covering in pitch Things like that are all going to affect the flavors of the foods when you cook them again. So think about smoke flavoring and salting and pickling. Those are all going to add those flavor profiles to your food when you cook those things later on. Um, just cooking over a wood fire gives your food a very specific flavor that is different from other types of food. If you cook over coal or if you cook over a gas stove or electric stove, you're going to get different flavors from your food depending on the fuel and the way that your, your food is cooking. Uh, certainly if you're going to use cast iron, for example, versus pottery, you're going to get different flavors in the food from your cooking materials too. Spices like grains would be ground by hand and maybe a little coarser as opposed to modern methods that could produce a fine flour like a mustard flour. Um, imported spices might be several years old and not as strong in what's available to a, a modern cook. You have a comment that says common practice, common practices even if you didn't specifically follow the communal theory for cooking, so. Yeah, you know, they would have filtered down, you know, you might not have known the exact reasoning behind everything, but you would have heard that this food was poison or that one should always be cooked in the springtime or, you know, you would have heard things like that. It would have been part of your cooking method. What you knew, what was passed down as wisdom would be affected by the humoral theory. So, um, Capsicum peppers were waiting to be discovered in the new world, but there was certainly still plenty of opportunity to create heat in medieval cuisine. We had mustard, garlic, ginger, and horseradish, and even onion to add the heat from the vegetable side, along with spices like black pepper, long pepper, grains of paradise, and cubeb berries, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, later to add that kind of heat. So it wasn't Capsicum spicy, the way we have foods today, but there was certainly the availability to add some lovely flavors to it. We had vinegar and verjuice. It was a very important component of flavoring in the Middle Ages. A lot of sauces have that sour vinegar or verjuice or wine component to them. Um, Tamaline sauce is a good example of a breadcrumb thickened sauce with a lot of raisins and cinnamon and a vinegary base to it. Um, here we've got some people gathering grapes and making grape juice, presumably to make wine. The picture on the right is specifically making their juice, though. Let's enlarge that. So they're sitting under a green grape arbor and they're picking the grapes right from that and squeezing that. And then I love this little contraption this fellow is using here. He's got some kind of bat that he's squeezing the juice into. And it sure looks like there's a spigot on the bottom to get the juice out of. Um, I'd like to know more about that little contraption personally. Um, and then vats of vinegar, wine, things like that would be on hand and would be not only a preserving method, but a flavoring method that would be used to um, bring acidity and brightness to flavors, bring flavors together, just like we use them today. So then we come to the medieval pickles, and I have a funny story to tell about Wikimedia Commons. All of my pictures here are from Wikimedia because most of the classical paintings and things like that are in public domain. Um, and so I was doing a search for medieval pickles, and I put that picture in, or that, that term into the search, medieval pickles. Now the center bottom picture is a photo of mine. That's compost. That's a medieval pickle made of things as they come out of the garden, really. You've got cabbages and parsnips and carrots and turnips and currants and all sorts of things in vinegar and you keep adding to it as things ripen in the garden. Um, and I expected a picture like the picture on the upper right with a barrel with the pickles in it when I put in the search term. But instead, pretty much the only picture that came up was the one on the left. And I had to look at that for a second and go, what is this? And then 
started laughing. Um, some of you, or the team knows me, knows that I'm a professional Mrs. Claus. And it struck me who this figure was. This is St. Nicholas. And the reason I know that is because of the three figures getting out of the barrel at his feet. If you look down here at the lower part of this picture, you see these three figures. And one of his miracles, the reason that St. Nicholas is uh, the patron saint of children is this miracle that involved these three boys. He was uh, in a town that was experiencing a famine and there was a butcher who had meat that was being sold. And so this raised suspicion and Nicholas went to investigate and he goes into the butcher's basement and he finds pickling vats with three boys in the pickling vats. And Nicholas goes into a rage and he punishes the butcher and he pulls the three boys out of the vat, restores them to life, presumably puts the pieces back on them, the butcher's been cutting off of them, and gives the, the butcher what for, for, for this uh, violation of, of humanity. So medieval pickles. <laughs> um, uh, so we know we had pickled meats. That's it. That's the one way that I can say, yes, we had pickled meats in the Middle Ages. But yeah, so Wikimedia Commons actually has a sense of humor uh, showing me this picture when I'm looking for medieval pickles. But they certainly did pickle all sorts of things like our compost and other things. So we know about a lot of spice blends. We're going to talk about those later. And there are few herb blends that are talked about in some of the, the this is the manuscripts that we have from the Middle Ages. Uh, we know that bouquet garni were called for in, um, by Chicard in uh, 15th century Burgundy. And the bouquet garni that he called for was made of sage, parsley, hyssop, and marjoram. In 15th century France, Le Viande, uh, there is a vert gay asked for, which is bright green, the literal meaning is gay green, referring to a mixture of green herbs such as parsley and sage with saffron used to color a dish yellowish green or clear green. And then there's in uh, 16th century French treatise, the French herb blend is called for parsley, sage, winter savory, wild thyme, marjoram, hyssop, pot marigold or calendula petals and basil. So not nearly as many herb blends. We see lists of herbs in recipes, but not usually a, a blend called for by a specific list of herbs that are part of the blend that's got a name. Um, but we have a few. So we've got these, um, these pictures. This is uh, gathering sage, and this one is gathering fennel. And there we have our bouquet garni down here. And the reason this is important is we're going to talk about our spices in a minute. But this is what you had. What grew next to you was what was going to go in your pot. What was going to be growing in your garden, what was going to be wild, the wild edible weeds, things that you had locally were the most prevalent things that were going to go in your pot. Yes, you may have had access, maybe if you were wealthy enough, to saffron and cinnamon and things like that. But those came from a really long way away and were considered very expensive. And so it wasn't something that was going to necessarily be flavoring your everyday food. So these are the flavors, the smoke flavoring, the pickle flavoring, the local herbs, the the aromatic aromatics that were growing in your cottage garden, this would be your flavor profile that you were going to be seeing most days. So let's look at that. How far were things coming from? So let's just take a look at this map for a second. Yeah, the blue root is the sea root and the red root is the land root. So here we have Europe, England's all the way over here off the map. You got France and Spain over here, right? Scandinavia is up here off the map over here. Um, and here we have Java and Indonesia and China and India and Persia and Arabia, all Africa, all of these places. So this is the route that the spices that we're about to talk about had to take. So this is why I'm saying the flavor profile of your foods were going to be much more dependent on the leeks and the cabbages and the you know primrose flowers growing in your garden than they were going to be on cinnamon, for example. All right.
let's talk about some of these and what they look like and where they're coming from. So ginger is a is it's actually a rhizome, it's a, a root, and uh, it comes from it's native to Southeast Asia. It grows in a variety of different places. Different uh, varieties grow in different places. Uh, different types of ginger, but it transports pretty well. And if they keep it whole, it stays pretty potent. It was one of the most common, if not the most common exported uh, spice in the Middle Ages. Uh, it probably is pretty close to that today, I would think, but it's grown in a lot more places now. So maybe the exports aren't, aren't quite what they were because people have it growing in their gardens and, and they, they brought their own to, to the table now. Next up, we've got cinnamon, and we've got two varieties here. If you look at these close-up pictures, you can see that the top one is cinnamon, cinnamon cassia, or cassia, and it's native to China and Southeast Asia, and the bark, this is, they're both barks of tree, and if you look at the one on top, it's very thick and pretty much a single pearl. If you look at the one on the bottom, which is considered true cinnamon, cinnamon, cinnamomum <laughs> verum, it's native to India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and it's got several layers. The bark is much thinner. It's You can take a piece of this stuff and crunch it in your fingers and it will powder in your fingers as opposed to the hard barky stuff that's much more stout. Um, and we get the cinnamon buds from this and, and the cat, uh, true cinnamon flavor. Um, so both of these are good. I think that the cassia has more of a woody flavor while the true cinnamon has more of a floral flavor. That's usually the way I try to describe the difference between people. They both have their uses. I think that if you're doing potpourri and even long simmers like hypocras or mold cider, I think that the, the cassia does really well with that. That woody flavor stands up to that. If you're doing something a little lighter, a pastry or a lighter sauce, then maybe the true cinnamon is the, the choice for that. The cassia especially is going to travel well. The flavor is going to hold with that really well. If it comes to you in that form, pretty much any time you grate it, you're going to get a good flavor out of it. So it would hold, hold pretty well. And here we come to clove. So up on the top left, you see the regular clove that you're all familiar with. Down on the bottom left, that's the plant. Those are the flower buds that they come from, and it's native to Indonesia. A little clove and orange on the bottom right. And the kind of dour looking fellow here, that's Magellan. And Magellan set out to try and circumnavigate the globe and to bring back spices and uh, make a name for himself. And instead, he got involved in a local fracas and in, got himself killed in a, in a local chieftain's fight. But one ship of his uh, cohort managed to limp back into port with a hold full of cloves and that cargo was enough to pay for the expedition, pay for the next expedition, pay for all of the loss of lives um, and turn a profit and send, send more people back out. So cloves were a very big money maker. Cloves are not only a seasoning, they're a medicine. If you just take a basic clove like that and put it on your tongue, your tongue will go numb. Um, they use it to this day in dental preparations. You can go down to your local drugstore right now and buy an oil of clove preparation to put on your tooth because it deadens. So it's got a lot of value for medicinal purposes, for flavoring purposes, for brewing and venting. It's used in all sorts of things. So quite an expensive spice. Just going back to Ginger for a question. There was a question in chat, which is, can you grow your uh, home, uh, can you grow your ginger at home um, that you find in your grocery store? And then we had an answer, which is yes, as a rule, it depends on whether it's been treated um, to prevent it from sprouting. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely one of those that if it starts to grow, you know, you've got it in your, your produce bin and it starts to grow, then you could certainly plant it. Um, and it depends on your climate. Know whether it's going to grow well or not. Um, I'm in Atlanta and it grows in my yard pretty well. I don't tend to harvest it much. I put it out there and I let it go, but it grows and it flowers and it's happy. So. Uh, and, and then there's some further comments that in Asia, beside clove buds, they also use the unmature, immature clove fruits, um, which are which are more um, camphorous um, than the buds. And then we have a further comment that 
And then in early uh, 17th century, the Dutch murdered 14,000 of its 15,000 inhabitants in the little tiny islands of which they grew so that they could control it more for money. Oh, yes. I, I, I think I had heard of that particular fracas. I am not surprised if that's a new one on me because um, cloves were money or the spices were money. It was the they were the driving factor behind the age of, of exploration. Um, Portugal had the spice islands, the spice trade cut uh, all tied up. Everybody else wanted in on that game and going around the Portuguese drove the age of expansion. It really did. So you can't underestimate the value and the amount of money and, and the fracas and power struggles that go around anything that's got a lot of money attached to it. Um, that spice is represented. A couple of hundred years later, it was tulips in Holland, but <laughs> for this time period, definitely the spices. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I think I mentioned that I got my images off of Wikimedia, and I think this is my favorite image I've ever seen on Wikimedia Commons. On the one on the upper left, that is a fresh nutmeg with the mace webbing still around it. Isn't that a gorgeous photo? I'm, I'm just in awe of that picture. Um, so nutmegs are the little hard inner seed of the nutmeg tree. The fruit is down there on the lower left. They're native to Indonesia, so you get this fruit on the outside. And then you get the webby mace that covers the inner seed that looks like that. And these are them when they are fresh. And then they dry and you end up with these little dried thing right here, little megs. And then this is the mace, which is separate. So mace is going to be a little orangier than nutmeg when they're ground up. Again, I think the mace has a little more floral uh, and maybe a little spicier taste to it than the nutmeg does. Um, and then this is one of the little types of nutmeg grinder. I like my microplane for nutmeg. That's my favorite tool for fresh nutmeg. Um, but you definitely want to get it fresh. It's just so easy to get fresh nutmeg and the, the ground stuff. Well, ground stuff in general loses its potency really fast. So you do want to get as much whole as you can and grind it yourself. I just think nutmegs are kind of alien looking too. I think they're very cool. And when I taught this class last, I didn't know this, but somebody said that the fruit is supposed to be really good. And that was the first time I'd heard that, that they were edible. The fruit is described as tasting insipid. However, insipid. In, insipid. <laughs> okay. However, in Indonesia nowadays, they make jam out of it and it has a pleasant, vaguely, slightly nutmeggy, fruity taste. If you add sugar to anything, I mean, you know, if they're going to make jam out of it, I'm sure they're adding sugar. <laughs> well, good. Good for them. Well, of course they're adding it. sugar. What else would you add? <laughs> right. They don't really have much in the way of honey in Indonesia. Interesting. Okay. All right. So our next spice here is pepper. And we have a variety of peppers here. Now, this one are our common table pepper, our black pepper, pepper nigrum, native to India, white and black pepper from the same plant. And this is it growing here. It's out these pods with all the little peppercorns, what ends up being peppercorns when they're dried, uh, on these kind of extensions of the stem. And then over here, we've got a period drying of two peppers. We've got pepper nigrum over here, and over here we've got pe pepper longum, or long pepper. Um, last time I did this, somebody asked me if long pepper meant chili pepper, and I said that was a great question. It, Hidden chili pepper being something that was discovered in the Caribbean in the New World with the expansion. But pepper longum is, let me go to this next screen, this. And it's native to Java in Indonesia. Um, and it grows in these long cones. Um, now, I have seen them quite large. I've got some right here that I got from Auntie Arwens that are tinier. They're, they're quite petite. Um, I'll show you these later on when I can stop my, my background. But these two peppers, the long pepper, I actually like long pepper slightly better than black pepper. I, I like the flavor of it. It's a little more mellow. It's got a little rounder flavor to it than the sharp spiciness of 
black pepper or pepper pepper nigrum, but they were um, the most common and they went back and forth between being the most popular and the most available between these two different um, these two different varieties here. And then we have cubeb berries or piper cubeba, the tail pepper or the java pepper, and it grows on a kind of a similar sort of looking arrangement, a little looser than the piper nigrum, um, native to Java and Sumatra. And they always come with these little stems on them, so they've got tails, right? They're the tail pepper or Java pepper. I feel like cubeb berries have a little hint of citrus. They're a nice light flavor with a hint of citrus. That's what I get out of them anyway. I like them. Um, they've been brought back into American uh, knowledge more recently because of Sam Adams beer. He uses cubeb berries in some of his, his flavors um, and their flavors. So some people have heard of that. It's used in Jamaican cuisine a little bit. So you find them in ethnic places that uh, either brewing or ethnic cuisine. And we've got grains of paradise, Aphromomum melagueta, or the melagueta pepper, alligator pepper, guinea grains, asame. Um, these are native to West Africa. They come in these little pods, uh, looking a little bit like mace and nutmeg there. And then when they're dried, they have these tiny little seeds. And this is what they look like. This is a really intense close-up. They're quite small. Um, I'll show you some here. Um, but when you're when they're ground, they go from being brown to be kind of a reddish, pale reddish red, white, and brown combination. You grind them together, you get kind of a tan powder out of them, um, and they've got a nice spicy, peppery flavor to them. Then we come to allspice which is a pimento. Now this is a new world and it's called Jamaica pepper, myrtle pepper, pimenta, or pimento. It was very confusing when I first heard it called a pimento because I always thought that was the red pepper. Um, <clears throat> but the name allspice was coined as the English as early as 1621 because it had the flavors of cinnamon, nutmeg, and clove. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's not correct for pre-17th century cooking outside of Central America, but if you're doing uh, pirate, Caribbean, Central American cuisine, then this would be your pepper, and it quickly became the predominant um, colonial pepper used in that area, and it's native to Central America, Mexico, and the Caribbean. There's actually a cookbook, it's a secondary source, what is it called, 700 Years of English Cooking? And there's a recipe in it that calls for allspice. And I always wondered how they got that because allspice is not a period recipe, right? Not a period ingredient. And I finally saw the original of the recipe that they had redacted and put in this cookbook. And the recipe used the phrase, and use all this. And the this was a thorn where the, the P, it kind of looks like a P with the hump in the middle right and they mistranslated that from use all this to use all spice because it looked like a pea and so all spice got put into this cookbook because they misread this translation so uh when you see it it's usually as uh our dear friend carrie doc says scribal error <laughs> He doesn't like saffron, so he, he jokes that whenever he sees saffron in a uh, in a recipe, that it must be scribal error. I got him to eat it, and he liked it. Did you really? Good for yes. you. Yes. I didn't tell him how much I had put in the dish, and he enjoyed it and praised it. Excellent. Good. I, I'm impressed. Very good. Which brings us to saffron, the very thing. Long known as the world's most expensive spice. I just, again, love, I'm in love with this picture on the right from Wikimedia Commons. It's such a beautiful botanical, it's such a treasure trove of botanical shots. It really is. Um, and then the piles and piles of saffron on that left. And then our upper left picture is from the Queen of Sanitatis. And this is a lady plucking the flowers. And then they take the flowers back and they have parties where they sit there and they pluck the three pistols out of each flower and uh, use them. The, the higher prized saffron has the fewest gold and yellow threads. 
So if your saffron has lots and lots of red threads and not very many yellow threads, then you've got a very high quality. And you also want to smell it. There's a, a whole grid of the ways that they grade saffron based on how much it smells, how much color it puts out into warm water by volume, um, how much flavor it imparts to a dish. So there's this whole um, uh, standardization that they can use to grade saffron based on how, how it has all these different effects. But it's highly prized to color foods, to flavor foods, to garnish foods, and often considered the most expensive spice in the world um, because it's so labor intensive and each flower only produces three little threads. And when I use it and a recipe says use a pinch or they say 12 grains or something where you're supposed to sit there and count little grains. I, no, if I'm going to use saffron, I want to know it's there. I use a generous pinch. I used some this morning and I was like, mm, I want to know that saffron's in there. Um, it, but it's native to Mesopotamia and Persia and Greece. Although later in period, it was grown in Spain and Turkey and into the Tudor period, even grown in England. So if you could get it local, then you were going to have more access to it than if it was coming from a far distance, of course. And we should talk about sugar as one of these seasonings because that's how it was used. It, until the Elizabethan era, it really didn't start becoming the main basis of a dish like a candy or a dessert. It was used as a seasoning, um, maybe not even in a sweet dish, but as a way to, as similar to the way today you might make a pot of spaghetti sauce and add a tablespoon of sugar to it to cut the acidity, but not to make the spaghetti sauce sweet. You weren't going for a sweet sauce, you used it as an ingredient. That's the way to think about the way that sugar was used in a lot of the medieval um, recipes. Um, it's native to India and Southeast Asia, and it, it was put in, it was manufactured in cones. So you went to a sugar merchant who had cones of this stuff and you bought pieces or chunks or whole cones from him. And then you had implements that would scrape the pieces off of your sugar cone. Which brings us to spice merchants. Uh, we tend to want to do everything ourselves. I take a small amount of, of uh, fault for having introduced the from the ground up movement, which really is not the way people would do things because in the Middle Ages, chances are you would go to a spice merchant and buy a blend like you would go to the store today and say, what does McCormick's have in the way of a poultry seasoning? And you might buy a blend from them. Same thing, you would go to spice merchants and they'd have their scales and you'd go and say, oh, I want some of that. And you would buy that from them. Uh, the picture down on the bottom left, this guy is selling sugar. He's got the big sugar cones. He's got his scales. Uh, the fellow on the right also got all his little bags of different types of spices, and he's going to weigh those out and produce blends for you the way that um, that you would buy them today. And of course, you want to make sure that you're doing business with somebody who's a reputable spice merchant because you don't want somebody who's going to sell you something mixed with sawdust or dirt or just a way to use up all of the old spices that don't have any flavor anymore, you know, and adulterated with other things. You want to make sure that who you're buying from is trusted so that you get the good stuff. And they might have different blends like powder for powdered powder deuce. We're going to talk about those in a second. Um, anybody have any questions about any of the images or things that we've touched on up till now? Or when, how are we doing on our comments? Uh, we're doing fairly well. We, we've had some extra commentary about what kind of bi, um, botanical families for grains of paradise and some other things in chat. But in general, Super. just just more information, <laughs> not any generalized questions. So I'm just okay. leaving them in chat for those who want to monitor them. Uh, but no questions at this point. That, that's, that's actually one of the beautiful things about the Zoom format is that we have that extra scroll ability to add those little, you know, uh, side comments, if you will. We all want to do like, oh, I know something more about that. And it's perfectly appropriate. And it's a way for people to refer back to those comments later on. And it it's a uh, makes the class run more smoothly. I think that's great. Okay. All right. So that's all I have on this particular presentation. And you can go back and look at all of those images. Like I said, with the exception of ones, a couple of that were from my personal photos, they were all available on in public domain on Wikimedia Commons. Most of the paintings, the Queen of Sanitatius, things like that, if, if it's a classical piece in a museum, 
it's probably up on on public domain you can probably find that kind of stuff now if you want a really high resolution that you want to do some serious research on a detail you might want to go to a museum website or talk to a curator look at a look at a more more uh, restricted access view of it but for the most point most part there's a lot to be gleaned especially some great botanicals um, and good drawings from our period all right, <clears throat> so let's talk about spice blends in the Middle Ages. And these are predominantly medieval Western Europe, although I've added a few others from some other areas. And again, I want to say that if you're doing research in, let's say, medieval Korea, then you're going to have a certain flavor profile that's unique to that area, too. I haven't included a lot of that here. It's very Western European based. but um, the principles of the looking at what's growing locally, what might be available, what's being imported at that time still hold true to, regardless of the area and time period that you're studying. So a powder, pudra, poldra, are spice blends that were bought from spice merchants, disreputable merchants cut things with things like sawdust and dirt, um, and they kept the recipe secret. The, there's a good deal of speculation that goes into recreating them. And most of the time we don't have uh, amount. Some of the times we do, um, but you want to trust your spicer have a good flavor uh, um, identification. They're, they need to be able to be somebody who knows how to make a good spice blend. I make my own spice blends. I think they taste good. When I give them to people, they like them. So they trust me as somebody who knows the good flavors to go together. And you would want that in your spice merchant and the time too. Um, so we have puro deuce or ground sweet spices commonly made with cinnamon, ginger, and sugar may or may not contain ground cloves, galangale, mace, or nutmeg. One version calls for nutmeg, fennel seed, and aniseed and different amounts, right? Different spicers are going to make, make them with varying amounts. Maybe one likes a little more cinnamon and a little less ginger, you know, things are going to vary like that. Powder fort is a strong pepper, uh, usually black pepper, long pepper, cloves, and nutmeg. Poudre fine, cinnamon, cloves, ginger, grains, paradise, sugar. White powder is usually just one of two things, ginger and sugar or cinnamon and sugar, um, we, possibly mixed with rose water. We have a question. Um, yeah. We've talked about spicer. Is that a spice merchant or is that someone who's making the mix? It would be the same person to my knowledge. I mean, maybe they would have an apprentice that just did the blends or some, you know, I would imagine it would depend on, on person to person. The question, I don't have a good detailed answer for that one. I would encourage you to dive into that rabbit hole and find out for yourself and let us know. <laughs> there are so many rabbit holes to dive down into. <laughs> Um, but to my knowledge, the spice merchant would be the one that would produce the blends. Now, maybe they had somebody that worked for them that was in charge of just doing the blends. That's, that's quite possible. Um, the strong black spice powder is quite wonderful. Black pepper, long pepper, cubebs, grains of paradise, and cloves. I have no tolerance for capsicums. So anything that's a red pepper, anything stronger than paprika or a bell pepper, I can't tolerate at all. But I really quite like this strong black spice powder. There is no capsicum in it, and it's got this lovely heat and all of these different flavors of heat that add together to make just a really beautiful, floral, spicy, deep, sharp, bitey combination. So I really like this strong black spice powder. In fact, I'm going to grind a little bit here. Uh, there's hippocras uh, spicing, which um, when mixed with sugar is usually called mixed powder, cinnamon, gallangale, ginger, grains, paradise, and nutmeg. Um, Duke's powder we find in 16th century Spanish, uh, cinnamon, cloves, ginger, sugar, things like this. So you would go to your spice merchant and you'd say, I want a powder fort or I want a powder deuce or et cetera. And they would have these different spiders, spiders. <laughs> powders that you could buy. 
Um, we also have some outside of the uh, medieval Europe in second century Rome. Our flavor profiles are this list of spices. You get a lot of black pepper. In a Pekis, every single recipe, it seems like, at the end says, and garnish with black pepper. It's like, it's like, and part, and put parsley on it in the in French cuisine. Everything gets a little liquamen and a little black pepper on it. Um, but you've got caraway, celery seeds, cumin, fennel, ginger, garum, vinegar, wine. That's the flavor profile that you're going to see in second century Rome. In Byzantium, you get a little bit more Eastern flavors, asafetida, capers, coriander, and dill. Um, again, honey, garum, and vinegar. In Norse culture, you see things like caraway, coriander, dill, the umbilifera plants, the mustards and thymes, garlic, onion, leek, wild alliums, um, vegetables pickled in lactic acid, which is going to give you a very specific kind of sour flavor to your meats. That are, it's not vinegar; it's it's a different sort of of, of lactic acid sour, more like uh, uh, sauerkraut. That got that kind of. Um, from food and drink in medieval Poland in 14th century, we see bay leaves, dill, dill seed, garlic, lovage, maize, parsley. Um, from the medieval Transylvanian cookbook, we see black pepper, cinnamon, cloves, horseradish, juniper, lemon, a little bit more Mediterranean in there. Um, there's a spice blend in Northern Africa called Rasa Hanu. Um, there's a uh, after the list of ingredients, I think this warning is interesting. It said that some Moroccan mixtures include Spanish fly and other rather dubious ingredients. So it goes back to really wanting to trust your spice merchant. And then za'atar uh, varies greatly. Each one of these spice blends, again, would be have proprietary knowledge of what actually goes into it, how much of things go into it, where those things come from. Um, but here's a basic list of this Middle Eastern standard. So when you're looking at cuisines of your area, if you look at the things that are grown in that area, the biggest agricultural exports from that area, what was available to them at that time period, then you can pretty much get a flavor idea of what things are going to taste like, what's available, what kind of flavors are going to be available in these foods. So Tar's comment is, is that it is a more, the blend is more of a modern take, so... And just a question, your class is two hours, correct? So that yeah. we're going another hour, yes. We probably aren't gonna go a full hour. We, we'll probably have maybe maybe another half hour and then we'll have a little bit of break be between then and the end. So just for us. everybody who just noticed that our next session that starts in 10 minutes, it, we are having another hour, so. And, and if you wanna go on over to that other session, we're gonna be talking a little bit more. I'm gonna show you some of the spices and we'll talk a little bit more about that, so. If you want to head on over to another class, that's just fine. Um, so I want to talk about some SCA merchants, and I'm not getting a kickback from any of these merchants. I'm not on the payroll for any of these. By, by the way, if I can interrupt here, yes, uh, one spice you left off the Apician recipes is lovage. They use lovage a great deal. So. I thought I, I know it may be in the, um, it may be in the Byzantium one. I know it's on there. Yeah, we don't have too many Byzantine recipes, but we do have that whole Apician. You're collection. right. Okay. I'll, I'll throw it in there. Oh, here it is. It's in the Eastern European stuff. All right. I'll go back and amend that. You're right, though. You're absolutely right. I actually grew Lovage this year for the first time and used uh -huh. a few things. It so I, I think they used the seeds, but people argue about whether it was the seeds or the herb. Again, you just, we don't know for sure. And especially with things that call for coriander. Are we talking about the greens? Or are we talking about the seeds? Um, so, okay. So a few SCA spice orange. So now that we've established that it is a perfectly period thing to do for your persona, go to a spice merchant and buy these blends, right? Here we have some SCA merchants that specialize in some of these blends. For example, we have Anti Arwins who have been around for a really long time. They've got a great website and they offer all of these different blends that you can buy. Now, we trust them at Anti Arwins mm -hmm. to put together a blend that we like, right? Maybe you don't like it, uh, but that's we are trusting them to put their flavors together in such a way that we find them pleasing when they're going to sell them to us. So we have all of these different um, types of cultures represented with types of things that they have for sale. 
I just want to make a comment, although I do spice research as well. I am not the anti-R1. My no. name is spelled slightly different, but um, definitely would would highly recommend them. So yeah, they're great. I have I have mm -hmm. bought from all three of these companies within the last year and been very, very pleased with everything I've gotten from all of them, um, which is why I'm throwing them out here because I, I got to the end of this class the last time I bought it. I, I taught it and I won't call her name. She's one of my former protégés though said, and where can we find these spice blends? And I said, At the places I just gave you websites for. <laughs> so I want to bring these to your attention. I mean, you can go to Penzi's, you can go to Whole Foods, but you can also go to SCA merchants and you could give them the money and you can get blends that are made up for period spice blends. What could be better? Um, here we have Dragon Marsh Apothecary. They're out on the West Coast. Um, they're a brick and mortar store. They have a lot of equipment. I got a bunch of uh, mortars and pestles and tea infusers and things like that. They don't have so many blends made up, but they have an entire section just for historical herbs. So if you go to their website and type in historical herbs, you get all of those ones that we just talked about and they're individual herbs and you can go in and read about them and, and select them that way which is super handy just a really nice way to have that organized and then this last one is oak city spice blends this is a lady in atlantia she's just started this this company up and she's got recipes from the period of cookbooks already made up for you. So if you want Duke's powder, you can buy Duke's powder from her. If you want the, the spice powder from Talamont, you can get that one. Um, I'll tell you this Viking salt. I did buy this from her and it is so good. I, I use it on all kinds of stuff. In fact, I've gone to the point where I'm going to get a shaker of it and just have it next to my salt and pepper. because It's, it's just really tasty. So she's somebody who's spiced taste I trust. I can I can buy things from her and trust that they will be good. So perfectly period for your persona to go to a spice merchant, buy these spice blends. And here we have some SCA folks from different corners of the country who specialize in those kind of spice blends for those kind of flavors that we put together. Um, so I, I just thought that was super important. And then here we've got some recipes. So if you want to try and make your own, we do have a few extant recipes that give us amounts that you can go in and recreate the amounts from what they had published. Um, here we've got a fine powder that calls for three te teaspoons of ground ginger, one and a half teaspoons of cinnamon, one teaspoon of grains of paradise, a teaspoon of ground cloves, two teaspoons of sugar. And see when you look at that, two, or two tablespoons of sugar is really not a sweet blend there. Sugar just kind of takes up a part of that. It's not a, 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 a flavored sugar like a white powder would be, which would just be cinnamon and sugar or just ginger and sugar. <clears throat> Here we've got that spice blend from La Viandier. The Talamont, we've got ginger, cassia, nutmeg, pepper, long pepper, cloves, grains, paradise, and gallingale. Here's this the Italian uh, strong black spice powder with cloves, nutmeg, black pepper. Cubebs and Grains Paradise. The Spanish recipes for Duke's powder, a um, couple different ways there. A sweet spice from 14th century and 16th century sources and uh, Catalan for another spices for the common sauce. So here are different things that you can try. Oops, that got pushed off onto another page. Um, if you wanna try and make your own spice blends, out of things that you can buy locally if you don't want to go and buy you know blend already from somebody made anybody have any comments on all of those things other than just a comment that that james prescott guy that you have listed as one of your recipes is actually master thorval who lives in abacal so <laughs> lovely that's fantastic uh i'm I may have gotten that from the floor legium actually, or if, uh, maybe let's see which one was that. Oh no, that's a that's a published book. Yeah, yeah. So different things that you can try if you want to try the spice blends, but I think that we get really um, caught up in the idea that everything's going to have all of these spices. But if you think back to 
if you think back to the the um, screen that I showed you of the Silk Road and how far these things would have to travel, and then think about basic socioeconomic status of your of your persona, would you really have had access to any of that? Um, well, there's another thing to consider, and that is, it isn't just that they had to travel a long distance. In the maritime trades, they could only go one way at one time of the monsoon season and back the other way at a different time in the monsoon season. So it would take almost a whole year just to go there and come back. And that brings us to weather, which affects the price and the trade routes and things like that and is still doing that to this day if you recall several years ago on christmas day or i think it was boxing day the next day after christmas there was an earthquake in the south pacific that caused a tsunami that took out a, a large chunk of was was it sri lanka that took the, the main hit from it i think um yeah. It took out a lot of Indonesian islands and it took out a lot of spice groves. Our vanilla bean prices still haven't recovered from that. Cubeb berries have become very um, uh, hard to hard to get. And so different things that happen today, the whole um, ever given stuck in the Strait of Gibraltar, those kind of things today disrupt our ability to get spices. Um, Old Bay seasoning. If you're familiar with Old Bay seasoning, it's really one of the only truly American spice blends. We talk about all these different spice blends from different times and eras. Old Bay is an American East Coast uh, seafood seasoning, and it's wonderful. I love it on all kinds of stuff. But for about a year, it could you just couldn't get it. It was not on the shelves anywhere. And I finally figured out why, because McCormick, who packages it now, has their packing plant in Wuhan, China. And so when the pandemic broke out, McCormick had to stop their production in Wuhan's in the plant in Wuhan. And so it disrupted the availability of getting all of the spices that are packed there. And one of those was Old Bay. So one of the questions that is, is, uh, was asked, I may have missed it, but do you know of any sources for how the spices were shipped in, in the Middle Ages? I assume whole versus ground, but I don't have a particular source. Whole, right. And is that is that what, Ursa team, is that what you were saying, whole? Maryland didn't shut down. It still says on the package of, I'll, I'll come back to you in a second, but the package of Old Bay still says made in America, but it's packed in Wuhan. <laughs> So McCormick is still an American company, but they've outsourced that job to the Chinese market and they pack a lot of spices there in that it, it impacted a lot of, of things. But Old Bay was just the one that I kept looking for. I guess I was, oh, I was moving back into my house after my house fire and I was restocking my, my spices. And that was one that I just couldn't find, you know, I wasn't going to get that one from Auntie Arwen's, obviously. Um, so, uh yeah, so that was that one was one that, that's just an example of how because they're coming from so far away, even today, that trade route can get disrupted really easily. And that I think puts into perspective how how rare they really were. Um, we were doing a persona class the other day and we were talking about if your persona is a noble lady, questions to ask yourself if you're putting your together your persona. The question is, if you were a noble lady, how many keys do you have and what do they open? And one of those is going to be your spice box or spice cabinet, wherever you're keeping your spices, because they're going to be very valuable. Um, the uh, the, midi the uh, Tudor Monastery Farm, part of the farm series that Ruth Goodman and the archaeologists in Great Britain do. Um, she did they did a christmas special and she had a locked vessel that she kept all of her spices in and they were weighed out very carefully and the very last pudding i think that she made at the very end of the christmas festivities got the very last of the powder that she had been saving out and it was a very um well measured and well accounted for batch of spices that she had just enough to get her through the Christmas season and that was going to be it come January no cinnamon nothing <laughs> you were done with all of those kind of spices which really showed 
you know, I think when we look at medieval recipes and we look at all of the recipes that say, and take cinnamon and take ginger and do this, it just seems like, oh, everything has got that in it. But I don't believe that that would be true. I think that your, your average food, your everyday food that you were going to be eating, your flavors were going to be coming from the garden, um, from your pickling and your salting and your smoking and your things like that, the, the flavor, the the cooking method, the preserving method, the time of year, things like that were going to be part of your flavor profile much more than the imported expensive spices were. And, and so, there were dozens, dozens of spices that grew in Europe and around the Mediterranean. And yeah. they keep getting left out so often when people start talking about spices, they just talk about the ones that have to it come from ones. far away. Right, exactly. So I mean, we you, listed, you listed the local ones when you made your lists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, well, yeah, and, it, and in the porridge class, we're actually going to go into that in a little more detail because we're going to talk about the fact that the porridge or pottage or whatever you had going, whatever you were calling that in your, your pot was going to be seasonal. It was still going to be pottage or porridge, but depending on the time of year, that product was going to be different depending on what was growing in your garden. So just to go back to some questions that are in chat that yes, um, just to break in, uh, have you tried Wide River? I saw that. No, I don't know what that is. Is that another spice merchant? I, I'm not sure if it, it, it hasn't indicated. And then there's the next question is, is what would have they been shipped in? You know, would oh, have right. it been in boxes, so barrels, containers. bags? Um, we've talked about that. I, I know there was a long conversation that we had running on the floor at Legium about that and a lot of speculation that there's not a whole lot of documentation. Um, I've played around with linen impregnated with wax, which works wonderfully. Yeah, if you have a pottery vessel and you have a food stuff in that and put a, a waxed linen over the top of that and tie it with string and even then wax the string, you've got a pretty good seal. Um, so I suspect that that was a, a shipping method. Um, hole in burlap bags, you know, I, I suspect that you'd just get a burlap sack of stuff coming from overseas. I don't think that you'd have like airtight anything. I don't see where they would be doing that. Y River is also native to Maryland. It has a spice blend like Old Bay, but slightly different. Oh, that's interesting. I am. Um, I have my own Old Bay recipe that I use. So I made my own when I couldn't get the package stuff. But that's yeah, also spices would have been shipped whole because they were growing it and then consolidating it and shipping it trying to process them by grinding them or roasting them or peeling them or whatever would just have added a whole nother set of problems. So well, they, now, for so example, with cinnamon, you do have to do some of that. They would peel the bark. Well, yeah, roll, it's the inner, it's the, the inner bark. It's not even yeah. the outer bark. It's the right. inner bark. So, so there's a little to, bit of processing that would you be have to peel there, the bark minimal. off, but that's not the same as powdering it. Right. Minimal. Yeah. And why would you want it powdered? It. Because it starts losing its flavor immediately once it's powdered. So well, that wouldn't be there are there there are a lot of anti a lot of um aromatics and uh, uh low low temperature um, aromatics that get lost so a lot of custom a lot of people even today um will ship um spices um and then grind them at the local at the local production facility just simply the fact that you will actually lose a lot of the flavor uh, flavoroids that actually come because they're very low in, um, you know, if you grind it, you lose it. So um, absolutely, absolutely. So the likelihood so, yeah, you really of it being, want them whole. It, it likely, as far as what the containers were, that they would be shipped in. That's a great question that we keep looking for good answers for. I think a variety of different ways, but I think you just can't discount a burlap sack. And I think that would have been it a lot, maybe, you know, wooden boxes, but, um, I think that's how you would be getting them and haul. And then I think we needed to touch on silphium, which was an herb that was so popular in Greco-Roman cooking and medicine that it was driven to extinction in the third to second century BCE. It was possibly related to the giant fennel and asafoetida was used as a substitute. So talk about things when somebody says, if you could time travel, what would you do? Going someplace and figuring out what sylphium tasted like. That's one I'd like to know because that must have been pretty great if they ate it to extinction. Uh, 
and it was in everything. They had coins with it on it. It was it was a super super popular food up until third second century BCE, and then it died out completely. And we'll never know what that one tasted like. There's quite a few people who are having problems getting access to your um, classroom, not just okay. because not with just the code. Um, maybe you could share your email that you could potentially work Absolutely. that work with them individually to try to get them access. Um, just simply to the fact that I've provided the code and they're still having struggles with it. So um, you, you definitely have to be signed into Google before it's going to let you get any farther. It seems like people who are signed into East Kingdom Gmail account issues are having issues with some global issues. So I okay. think it may be a slightly different individual issue rather than just the code issue that we seem to have resolved at the beginning. So I see. Well, I don't know that I can help any further than that. It Other than maybe you can share with them, you know, the presentations and then that. Well, way I'd be happy different. to directly email you if you can't get into them yes i'd be happy to, to yeah, just Thank drop you. me an email i put my email in the chat if you send me an email um my email is messed up and i'm at my house or i am not at my house that has no power right now so don't expect an immediate reply i'll get to you <laughs> hopefully later this week i'll have all that resolved and i'll be able to get back to you and i'll send you all the documents and attachments so you can get them that way okay so i have a few spices to show um, if you want to take a moment and stretch, if you want, if you're sticking with us and you want to take a moment and stretch, this is a good minute to do that. Okay. I'm just going to try to recopy your uh, your, when I can find it, uh, recopy your classroom and the code again, just for those who are interested. Oops. To everyone. Do you wish to for me to stop the recording at this point? No, you can leave it going. Okay, just asking. Um, we like I said, we won't go through the whole next hour, so cover the stuff that I'm going to cover. Let's see, what am I looking for here? Settings. Device is ready to set up and ready to go. Okay, well, that's what I want. Uh, I need to get my technical assistant. I'll be right back. I will be back in two okay. seconds. I want to set this up. I have put it in. It says that it is set up and ready to go, but I'm not exactly sure how to. Can you select it in your cameras? Are you in Zoom? I am in Zoom. Oh, in you Zoom. Zoom. Okay. So video. That one right there. Nope. No. That's my background. Hold on. Let me cut my background off. There we go. And uh, and we're up. All right. Hooray. I I did. I didn't know where to look. Okay. Let's see if I can do this and not make everybody And laugh. we see and and we see it quite well. Super. Um, So I'm using a new piece of equipment, so just bear with me for a second. Well, I try to find a way, but it's not going to make me nauseous looking at it. How's that? That looks pretty good. Okay. There we go. All right. So, hey, sweetheart. Sorry. 
Was she? <laughs> well, you were close to the That's not I mean, That was my so I had a few of our spices here and I want to follow the recipe for that Italian powdered fort the very fine black strong spice powder and it called for cubebs and We're having problems hearing you. Okay. How's that? Is that better? That is a bit better, yes. Okay. Thank you. I, I moved away from the very front of the computer. All right. So these are cubebs, and you can see they've got the little tails, little stems attached to them. And that's the first ingredient that I'm going to go ahead and put in my grinder. These are the long pepper, and these are some tiny little long peppers. Um, I have had them before where they were much bigger than this, but these are the size of, you know, maybe a big staple. Um, they make It makes them easier to grind, I will say that. So I'm going to put those in. And I have some cloves. Everybody knows what cloves look like. You've all seen those at the holidays. I've got some Cracked black pepper, that's our piper nigrum. Here are my grains of paradise. Remember how I was saying how tiny those are? There's the little tiny seeds from the inside of the grains of paradise pod. Have those. And then I've got some nutmeg, and obviously I'm not going to grind that nutmeg. I'm going to use my microplane. And the microplane is great for a whole lot of different things. You can do cheese and chocolate and ginger. It's fantastic for raw ginger. Um, really good for this. You can also grate uh, cinnamon on this, like the the cinnamon, the cassia cinnamon that was so hard, the barky stuff. If you use that on this, you get a nice powdered cinnamon out of that. So I'm going to go ahead and use my microplane to grind my nutmeg in here. And this recipe calls for a lot of nutmeg, proportionally. So I'm going to grind a fair amount. Of, oh, that's so fragrant when you grind it fresh like that. And then I'm going to take my mortar and pestle and start crunching. Now, when I did this the last time, I put in an hour of grind time on this to make it into a powdered blend that I was able to say, yes, I, and I put it through a couple of different strainers and ended up with that. And it's still really aromatic. I made this a couple of weeks ago. So it's kind of a golden reddish brown with a mixture of all those different peppers. Once you grind them up and get the insides out, um, you've got this beautiful pepper, spi pepper spice. This wonderful on red meat, of course, uh, really great on roasted vegetables and things like that. Uh, so a lot of things that you can do with that and like i said since i don't do capsicum pepper at all i love this nice warm spice blend that i can make and i can handle the heat because it's all this different types of heat it's not the, not the red pepper heat that and i can't it's good handle. on omelets good on omelets oh i'm sure yeah eggs eggs would be really good with that um and then i have a few of the Oak City Spice Blends to show off. I've bought these since I did this class. This is my new favorite. This is her Viking salt. And the only part of this that's not period is she put turmeric in it, which I asked her about it and she went, because I like it that way. And I said, okay. Uh, I don't think the, the Vikings would have had turmeric I, unless they were, you know, the Varangian guard down in, in Byzantium. But, um, it's got two different kinds of smoked salt. It's got a, an apple smoked salt and a cherry smoked salt. And celery, no, black pepper, toasted onion, apple and cherry smoked salt, and turmeric. And it's delicious. It's just one of my new favorite things, and I want to put it on everything. Um, I made this morning, I uh, 
made some gruel because I'm making this is pottage day. We're talking about pottage in the next class. Um, and the gruel of almonds that I made from Forma Curry called for almond milk, oatmeal, saffron, and salt. So I did that. I made that. And then I added a little of the Viking salt to it because it's already got saffron in it. So I figured the turmeric would go along with that just fine. And it really, oh, it was so good. It wasn't sweet at all, but it was just really delicious and a perfectly period recipe. Um, this is her Le Viandier 1395 spice blend that comes from one of the medieval recipes. And the nice thing about this company is that she grinds all of these spices right before you sends them to you so when you put in your order that's when she does the grind so when you get them they're nice and fresh so i told you i'm not doing i'm not getting any kickbacks from this company i'm not I'm, i don't work for any of them but i just really appreciate um people who know what we're looking for and put the time into creating those blends so that um you can purchase them just for what you want to do um and uh, Oh yeah, that, that's going to take some upper arm strength and power, and I'm not sure this desk is up for the, the kind of power I'm going to have to put into that and grind it. Um, and there's no reason that you can't put this in an electric spice grinder. Um, I can do it through this, or I can put it in an electric spice grinder. Um, certainly if I was going to do it in small batches right then for when I wanted to use it, that would be great. Um, there are certain things that I think the texture matters when you use a, a, a modern appliance as opposed to uh, the traditional way. I don't think this is one of them. I really, <laughs> I think that the, the powder that I was able to achieve with this after putting it through a sieve is pretty much the same kind of fine powder I would get out of an electric spice grinder. So I, I don't think you lose anything by using a modern convenience for that one. And this does take an awful lot of for arm strength to get it down to the powder that you want. That's why I think that the spice merchants had apprentices to do this part because that's where all the manual labor is, is in the grinding. Comments, questions? There are no more comments in chat. Okay. Well, since I had to decamp from my house today and I am not in my kitchen, I don't have anything else to show off today. I did manage to bring my, my little spices to show off my, my grind, but um, that was the only part that I was able to make portable enough to come. So that brings me to the end of my class at this point. So I'm going to call that if anybody has anything. Hello, what is that? If anybody ha has any questions or wants to contact me, we can put my email address one more time in the chat. Here, I'll go ahead and do that. So I mostly have been concentrating on uh, cuisines of the Islamic world. Yes. So I did a comparison of the seasonings, not just the spices, but other things that would season the recipes in the savory recipes in al-Baghdadi's cookbook and the anonymous Andalusian. And they have different flavor profiles. I'd love to see those. Would you like I, didn't, to I didn't compare the sweets because sweets tend to use the same ingredients over and over and over again. And cinnamon is not one of them. We put cinnamon in all our sweets and I all hate it. All our sweets, yeah. And usually it. that was more of a meat flavoring. So, so would, you, would you like me to stop recording? Yes, you can stop recording now. Thank you very much.